So I apologize for the delay in us getting started. Um, it was brought to my attention uh, just a few moments ago that some of our correspondents had uh, inconsistent starting times. So um, we just wanted to give folks a chance to um, join if they saw the later starting time. And um, what we'll do is we'll just cut into our break a little bit. Um, it was a fairly generous 15 minute break anyway. Um, so we'll go through, we'll make sure um, Dr. Oliveira has enough time to present and do her Q&A session. Um, and then we'll uh, just have a little bit shorter of a break so everybody can hear the presentation. So um, thank you all so much for being able to join us this morning for these incredible presentations. Um, and thank you so much to our sponsor, Takeda, um, for helping us uh, create this virtual event. Um, I just wanna take a few moments to go over some housekeeping items and then we'll shift right into our program um, as people are still trickling in. So this is just a brief look at our agenda. Um, we have a few topics related to pediatric intestinal failure um, and some research that our presenters would like to share, as well as getting to hear from uh, a caregiver of um, a short bowel patient at the end. We'll also have time for a live Q&A session after each presentation. Um, and then, like I said, a little bit more of a break. So we'll do um, 11.30 to 12.15. The Q&A will go from 12.15 to 12.30. And then we'll have a little bit of a break um, from 12.30. Um, yeah, it will work itself. <laughs> um, so just some Zoom housekeeping etiquette. Um, this is going to run like a meeting rather than a webinar so that we have more of a chance to um, interact sort of with one another. Um, so we do ask a few things of our attendees so we can make that happen. Um, please do stay muted unless you are asking a question during the Q&A time, um, but feel free to drop a question in the chat box. Um, Oli staff will be moderating that. So we'll make sure that your question doesn't get missed when the Q&A session does arrive. Um, you are also welcome to have your video on or off. That's completely up to you. Um, if you do choose to have your video on, we just ask that you remain stationary in one place. Um, we aren't, so we aren't walking around um, getting a tour of the house, um, not making anyone car sick, and just have sort of an appropriate space and background to minimize distractions from our presenters. Um, we would also like to remind you that this is being recorded. Um, so that will be able to be viewed later on our mini meeting website. Um, and we would also like to make a disclaimer that our presenters cannot provide any individualized medical advice. So please make sure to keep your questions um, broad. Um, and please make sure to discuss any information that you receive today with your provider or care team um, before many, making any changes to your own uh, health care. So with that, I'm going to pin Dr. Oliveira. And I would like to introduce Stephanie Oliveira. Um, Dr. Oliveira is a pediatric gastroenterologist. She cares for patients with intestinal failure, short gut syndrome, and other pediatric nutritional disorders. In addition to her pediatrics and pediatric gastroenterology training, she has an additional year of training focused on advanced pediatric nutrition at Cincinnati Children's. She's also involved in research studies on intestinal failure. And you can read more about her on the Meet the Speakers page, which is located on uh, our mini meetings page, oli.org slash mini meetings. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Oliveira. And make Thank sure you so you much. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maisie, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present. Uh, this was originally supposed to be presented in person at, uh, in St. Louis and uh, my flight was canceled last minute. So I'm so happy that um, I'm here presenting. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, a project that we are we have developed at Cincinnati Children's. Um, for, and the goal of this project is ultimately to improve care. Um, and so uh, we'll be talking about the remote patient monitoring in pediatric intestinal failure. And this is my team. A lot of these names may sound familiar to you.
I have nothing to disclose. And the learning objectives, the first we are gonna learn how the, RP, how the RPM program is designed and how the patients and caregivers access looks like. The second learning objective, we're gonna describe how the RPM program improves care of patients with intestinal failure. And third learning objective, describe how the RPM program improves quality of life of caregivers and patients. So uh, this audience is well versed on intestinal failure, and you know that's not easy to get from picture one to picture two. Uh, there is a lot of work that happens uh, in different fronts, from the healthcare team uh, side and family, and you know support systems. So it's really a teamwork uh, that's not easy. But you know if the, if there is anything we can do to make this more doable, um, you know, that's what the team tries to do to, to help these kids. Um, this is a patient of mine and, uh, and it, it's very nice how this picture was taken and it shows uh, his entire routine. It's hard to read on the board, but like his mom made sure to add everything that she does, that she has to do with him extra than she would if he, did I have intestinal failure? And now his supplies and uh, TPM pump. And um, and you see his beautiful smile, despite all of that, he's a happy toddler um, with intestinal failure. Uh, I'm gonna um, run, run a video that actually, it's a very short video that explains a little bit about our program. I think it's gonna give you more of an idea what are we gonna talk about in more detail. So I, I Patient Monitoring Program is a hospital-wide project that um, it's uh, introduced in different divisions. And the, the main goal is to somehow improve the care of those patients. So when we develop the program in intest for intestinal failure patients, uh, the question that we had for ourselves is like, what do we think could make things easier for families but also an improve kind of interaction between team and, and caregivers and ultimately improve care. So, you, you know, I think um, it's very well known that doctors who work with pediatric intestinal failure are extremely protective of their patients and we monitor them very closely if they are in the hospital, even if they are admitted in another hospital, another institution. And we really want to keep a close eye on what it's happening at home, um, and, and we see that in clinic, um, you know, very frequently, more frequently than other patients. Um, in our team, in our group, patients that are home on TPN are seen clinic every four to six weeks. Um, so what happens during those visits, as you all know, is that you come to clinic and you give your team a summary of what happened in the last month, right? Like, so this is what happened, this is how he did. Um, and that summary can just be so good because there is a limited amount of time that you can share with your team what happened during an entire month. So, and, and we can get different reports depending on, you know, how uh, detail-oriented the family is, you know, are these parents, are the parents the main caregivers? Maybe the kids are taken care of by the grandparents, but the parents bring them to clinic. Um, or, you know, the, the most of the care happens, um, you know, at school when the parents are just home with them at night. So that the report may be very variable 
depending on all of those things. So our main goal uh, with this project was to standardize home data collection. So when you so we have reliable information um, and accurate data uh, of home data of what happens when they are at home. So with that being said, all of those problems that it, that are, could be happening uh, in between connect visits can be identified sooner than um, if we are waiting just for the next visit to to address. And ultimately, as like a, a kind of like a, you know, our dream would be that this could help expedite TPM winning. So this is what I talked about, you know, what, how we worked before RPM, we'd have a clinic visit, then several weeks later, another clinic visit, and just here, after we reassess the patient, or obtain an accurate weight, um, a lot of home scales, you know, they, can, they are not calibrated like the hospital scale. So, um, you know, we, we tend to not uh, trust, for lack of a better word, home scales, uh, unless we know that it's truly uh, calibrated. So we don't typically didn't make TPN changes based on home weights. So we would wait for the clinic visit. Okay, the patient gained weight, they're doing well, we can make a change in the TPN or they are not doing well, they need to gain more weight. We, we would make a change in the TPN. With the RPM, we had the clinic visit and uh, in between, sorry, in between clinic visits, we have all this data that's entered by the caregivers and patients in an app in a very easy way. And this data is automatically transferred to the medical team. So all the patients are doing uh, is, you know, uh, with intestinal failure population specifically, we are very interested in um, intake and output. How much is the baby pooping, right? Like, and then some families, uh, we request them to uh, weigh diapers. So we have a, a good understanding of how this two output is. So, so then, you know, at, on an everyday basis, you can add that in the app and that will come straight to the medical team. Um, and then based on that data, we can see, oh, this two output is increasing. This is higher than the baseline. What's going on? Or, oh, this patient is doing better than we thought. He gained a lot of weight. We will be able to cut some TPN even before the next clinic visit. Um, so there, there is a potential that we can make um, a lot of changes in the nutritional plan based on additional data that we receive. So when we look at our population, the parameters that we wanna collect, uh, again, things that would, uh, we, we, we have to always be careful to not increase the burden on families, right? So these were things that we are already asking them to do, and just families were having different ways of keeping track of that. But weights, um, you know, a lot of families have home scales, but now we provide them with a hospital grade scale that's accurate, that we know it's calibrated. And we ask them, depending on the patient, but, you know, weights can be done as frequent as weekly and sent to us. Temperatures in the patients with central lines daily. And, and that being said, we, we, we ask for that more so to see a trend. Of course, if a patient has the fever, they have to call. They cannot just put the data in an app, right? And the intake and output daily. There is also opportunity to put immunizations, PCP visits, and diet recall. So as you can imagine, different families had different systems on how they would track things. And like I said, in those visits, uh, we get all these reports diff with different levels of details and different ways that families would track uh, details from, you know, very organized ways, you know, sometimes some Excel um, spreadsheets, but then sometimes just like, you know, things written in a napkin. Uh, so the quality of the data was very variable. With the remote patient monitoring uh, program, what happens is uh, every family um, uh, has an app installed in their uh, smartphone. And uh, the app is customized to our population. So it has the information that we medical team want from the family. 
So uh, as I said, we, we, there is opportunity to put data on intake, output, the weight. Um, and this data comes straight to um, the medical team. And there is a report that's, that comes up in the electronic medical record. Um, so it's easier for your team to see what's going on. A lot of you, you know, of course, different institutions have different systems for electronic medical record, but some of you may have seen this screen when your doctor shows your child's growth chart. So we have an opportunity just to show the growth chart of the RPM weights only. Um, and so that's a very good way of tracking what's going on at home. And also uh, the intake and output, if there are healthcare professionals in the audience, you know, uh, how helpful it is to have data and, and the medical records so we can see trends. So for example, here in this case, um, you can see that this patient has a pretty stable to output around 300-ish. Uh, so it's one of those things and has happened before when we are looking at the trends of the patients and a patient that before used to have 300 mLs of stools on a daily basis, now it's having 700. So what, what happened there? There was a situation where we figure out just by looking at that and the patient was doing well, there was, they had not noticed that much of a difference, but we did. Uh, and we noticed that he was not taking one of the medications that he was supposed to take to uh, decrease his output. So we are able to capture that problem before it became a bigger problem, you know, because if you're pooping too much, and this is not being recognized that it eventually lead to dehydration, you know, blood work abnormalities. So that's one of the examples of how this system can be helpful. And then, you know, medicine, everything, uh, we, we tend to look at data and like look at the statistics and how this um, can improve care. So, um, we now enroll all of our patients in this program unless the family absolutely refuses. And that has happened maybe a couple of times for different reasons, but most families are very welcoming of this opportunity and are very uh, positive about. So we had about, we have had about 40 patients enrolled since we started the program a couple of years ago. And um, some of these patients, we had data before there was RPM and then data after we had RPM. So we are able to make a comparison of how fast we, are, we, are, we were winning TPN before we had the RPM program and how fast are we winning after. And what we saw is that there was a difference um, in, in how um, fast we were able to win uh, some parameters of the TPN um, and, you know, in the, in the group post RPM, specifically the volume reduction of the TPN was uh, statistically significantly different from a pre and post RPM group. So benefits that we have identified, early identification of dehydration, increase in PN calories due to poor weight gain between visits. So instead of waiting, you know, that you see a patient one day and um, you're gonna see the patient again six weeks from now, and let's say at the three week mark, we see that the weight is actually going down, you can intervene at that point, increase calories. Um, and then by the time the patient comes for the visit six weeks later, uh, we already see the results of that increase in calories. Um, it's very important, this does not replace clinic visits. This does not replace close contact with a medical team. It's just another tool to improve care and to make this care of patients with intestinal failure even more personalized. I have one story and this family uh, gave me permission to share this story. So Jaden, as a kid with Chagat syndrome, about 40 centimeters left of small bowel. And um, he has been a patient of us even before we had RPM. And you can see the speed of how fast the TPN volume and TPN calories were decreased. Um, and this was before the RPM enrollment. And there are several other reasons why it was this low age and you know how clinically well, he was, 
But since we uh, enroll in an RPM, the, the speed to decrease volume and color is significantly uh, increased. And he was actually able to come off TPM much sooner than we were expecting before. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that we are seeing that he was doing, like we would make a change in the feeds and we are seeing that he was doing better than we thought and he was gaining a lot of weight. So, okay, let's cut TPN more aggressively at home before even he comes back. Uh, also, it gave the parents some sense of like confidence that, okay, I can push him a little bit harder. I can challenge him. He's doing well, right? Because a lot of parents, uh, understandably, um, because these kids with intestinal failure have been through so much, are hesitant uh, to, you know, to make changes and the child doesn't do well, ends up in the hospital, right? So that gave the family a, a little bit of extra confidence of, okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this data now. There are numbers here and I see that my kid is doing well, not just because he looks well, he is uh, legitimately doing well. And I think one thing that's very important to talk about anytime we talk about TPN weaning, right? Because um, it's the, was the patient weaned off TPN, but how is the growth, right? Because we don't want to wean anyone from TPN and the child becomes malnourished after that. So this is just important to highlight that this was done with good growth. Uh, and now he's being entral autonomous for over a year. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, my dream or our dream or our, our ultimate goal with this program is that really we decrease the burden on families and caregivers. And just to give an example, and some of you may be familiar if you have someone with diabetes in your family with insulin dependent diabetes. So diabetes um, is an extremely burdensome disease for uh, the patient. Uh, you know, you they, there is a there was an article I read that said that like a diabetic, an insulin diabetic person makes about a hundred more decisions a day than a non-diabetic because you're thinking about what I'm gonna eat, how much I'm gonna eat, and if I'm gonna eat, how much insulin should I give? And you know, if and if you give too much insulin, you can get sick. And then so how all of those things that diabetics need to think about. Uh and uh, and sadly, diabetes was a fatal disease, uh, like not too long ago. Like, like if you think about like in a uh, hundred, insulin was discovered a hundred years ago. So before that it was a fatal disease. Um, so the amount of like improvement we've had in the care of diabetes in the last hundred years is just amazing. So nowadays a diabetic does not need to measure their blood sugar, like does not need to do finger sticks because there are devices that do this automatically, devices that are connected to, your, to the body, to the skin, that give continuous glucose monitoring data like, like you see in these graphs. So not too long ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, all the diabetics were measuring finger sticks, writing a piece of paper, bringing to the doctor, the doctor would review. Uh, and maybe some is still do that, but the standard of care now is to have a continuous glucose monitoring data uh, monitoring that measures blood sugars every five minutes. You know, there is no way it could be better than that uh, by doing finger sticks. So there is no pain involved. There is no needles involved. The data is collected, it's placed in a graph and goes straight to the medical team. At any given point, let's say the patient is not feeling well, and calls the doctor saying, hey, I'm feeling very dizzy in the last few weeks. The doctor in the office can pull this report for every patient that they have and see, well, your blood sugars have run really high in the last few weeks, what's going on? Or they, or maybe they have, they are very low. So, so just the amount of uh, burden that was measuring blood sugars, keeping track of blood sugars uh, before this and how much this has improved is, I think is fascinating. Uh, of course, every disease has the has um, you know some specific characteristics, right? Like with kids on TPN, uh, you know, it'll be hard to replace someone that's gonna go connect TPN and run TPN, disconnect TPN. But 
anything we can do to make this less burdensome, it's, it can make a big difference uh, in the family, not only the patient, but the family quality, family's quality of life. And uh, this is one of the reasons I'm so excited to present this. I have presented this topic in several uh, medical conferences, but um, it's the first time I'm presenting to an audience of patients and families. And, and, you know, and that's the thing. We think we're doing the right thing, right? But there may be things that patients and families may think about that we are not thinking about. So uh, we are more than happy to get any feedback or any suggestions in order to improve this program. Because sometimes what we think is important to us is not important to the family and vice versa. So this is just how uh, the device looks like. And I'm not, you know, don't have any, this is not an advertisement. It's just to kind of say uh, there are different brands and different types, but that even you can use your smartphone to track your blood sugars. So that's, you know, I, I showed you guys where we started, where we are now and where we wanna get, where we wanna go. So um, I wanna thank my team that we've developed this program in the last couple of years and everyone here in this picture and more people that are not here were very important for the development of this program. Um, and I just wanna take the opportunity to also talk about our patient education day is our third year doing, we are doing this on um, September 15th, a free event, virtual event, uh, and we welcome all of you to join. We have a great agenda uh, of different talks, uh, focus on patient and family education. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I saw there was one in the chat, um, she said, I am curious about compliance on caregivers following through with daily monitoring doc and documenting in the app. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, great question. And, and that's very uh, personalized too. Not every patient needs to enter daily data, right? So typically what we recommend in a new patient that's going home on TPN, like a baby that's staying in the NICU for several months and now is the first time they're going home, we will require daily data as we did before. Uh, you know, that's, and, and over time, as the patient grows, then, you know, the monitor may be less frequent. Um, so, so initially the compliance, um, you know, because we stress the importance, like with infants, it's pretty good. As the kids grow, uh, of course, you know, kids are going to school and, you know, it's not possible to do it every day. Uh, so we do, you um, we did learn the hard way because initially we were asking them to do every day and the compliance was not good, but it was our fault because, you know, that's really hard to do. So that was something that um, the families actually input helped us change and easily uh, we can personalize every patient to have a different frequency. And they also added, um, are there challenges if there are multiple family members or caregivers caring for the child recording data in the same app? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we actually have several patients that, uh, you know, they have two households, uh, you know, they spend some days with mom, some days with dad, or even kids in foster care. And we had a case of a kid that went through different foster cares, foster homes. So it's actually very easy. It's the same app and anyone can enter data and it kind of like condenses in the same report. So we've had a great experience with that. Thank you. Um, we have another one. John says, I know you touched on using the RPM program for pediatric intestinal failure and diabetes. Do you think the program would be beneficial in other chronic disease conditions and is funding slash buy-in difficult? What, what I did understand the last part of the question. Uh, is funding and buy-in difficult? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we do have several RPM programs in the hospital. So I don't know details of those, but like uh, patients on hemodialysis, uh, oncology patients, our post liver transplant patients, and each one of these programs is tracking different things, right? That are important for them. Um, and so, yes, definitely there is a role for RPM in a lot of chronic conditions. Um, funding, that's a very important question. Uh, so here at Cincinnati Children's, this is a hospital-wide initiative funded by the hospital. Um, there are 
we are very blessed and grateful for that. There are several vendors of RPM um, programs, RPM apps, uh, so it's available. But I think, you know, uh, I think what the important thing is the concept, right? And then um, a lot of things, you know, United States, of course, and because they have to be very regulated because of HIPAA, um, you know, so it's not just as simple as creating an app. Uh, you know, there, there is some, a lot of regulations that need to be put in place. Um, it's not the same in other countries. I'm from Brazil. So actually I presented this in a meeting once and a physician from Brazil actually was able to replicate uh, that uh, because, uh, you know, their, the, the access to medical information is different there. So, so I think the concept is important. You know, there are ways we can monitor our families more closely. Um, so, because it is, you know, it, it is a costly program. We give a scale to every family and we have um, a group of nurses uh, that are specifically focused on reviewing this data, organizing the data and putting, you know, in a report. So uh, that's one of the main challenges, I think, to um, spread that across, but, uh, but you know, not impossible. And actually with a diabetes example, uh, it became over time a standard of care. So the, the, own, the, the own device that kind of, in, in, in there is not only one, they do have a, a system, a nap that uh, is free once you have the device um, to to track data. So it, you know we are in the very early stages of this, but uh, I I see that there is a lot of potential for the future. Thank you. And you sort of touched on this in that answer, um, but Emily asked, have you given thought to roll out of this to other healthcare systems? And what can patients do if they're interested in having something like this adopted at their hospital to bring it to where they're treated? And then she said, Ad, uh, for added context, as recently as this week, I've heard patients in Facebook groups asking if there are apps available where they can track IO and coordinate this with their child's school. Yeah, like people say, there's an app for everything, right? <laughs> I'm sure there, <laughs> there are apps and you know, you can develop your own system for yourself if you want, right? To track your own child, but it gets a little bit more complicated when we want to do this in a healthcare system, like I said, because there are several regulations, right? But um, I'm not familiar with any specific app, but I'm sure there are ways that we can track. You know, we have families like the parents are engineers; they bring the data in a very organized way. So you can do this to help your team, right? To I think this gives like some insight on how important for us is to have accurate and organized data. Uh, so other healthcare systems, you know, this is a very, um, this is all very preliminary, right? We started this a couple of years ago, so it hasn't been our focus just yet to expand, but it's definitely something that we think for the future. Uh, but talking to your medical team and, you know, asking if there is any potential for this, you know, um, and there are publications about it. There are like some examples and we are happy to share our experience too with, if any of your teams has questions about it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat as people have been doing or use the um, raise hand feature um, under reactions if you would like to unmute yourself and ask. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule, so we have some time. It's interesting that we, we may think, uh, we are surprised by the acceptance of this, right? Like, so not every family is super tech savvy, but it's such a simple system that, you know, it's not any more complicated than using Facebook, for example. So like we had, we never had a situation where families say, oh, this is too complicated. So um, thankfully, you know, it's a very simple technology. There are, um, and I think also it's not widely available, but like it, um, there are already technology, there, there's technology for, you know, some feeding pumps, uh, TPN pumps, 
that have Bluetooth ability and will be able to transfer volume like automatically to, um, you know, oh, this is how much TPN was infused. Uh, but this is not widely available yet. So there's a lot of potential and uh, with the goal to make life easier, not more complicated. We don't wanna make things more complicated. We have to make things easier for everyone. Thank you. We'll give it just another minute and see if any final questions pop up, but. Sure. And my email's on the screen. I'm happy to take any questions after if they come up and I'm happy to always share this program with other institutions. Was this, I, I apologize, because you may have said this, um, was this brought out prior to or after um, COVID and people staying home and, and having to be in quarantine and things like that? That's a great question. So uh, the concept and the idea has has been there for way before COVID, but the COVID expedited the, the, like, the launch of the program. So we are kind of brainstorming and then when the, the, when COVID came and we are not able to see the kids in clinic. And again, this doesn't replace clinic visits, but we actually started the program during COVID. It was March, 2021. And, and it just, it was so helpful during that time because, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't see kids in clinic, you know, telehealth visits are not the same as in person, but we had accurate data. We had um, uh, scales that were accurate and, uh, the families were at home with the kids, so they were measuring data. So we were able to do a lot of things that we probably wouldn't have been able to if it wasn't by this. And um, and it was something that continued after COVID, of course, because we uh, now it's just part of our care. You know, it's just um, if it, it has proven to be so helpful that it continued after COVID. Thank you. Um, we had another. He said more of a comment than question, but I'm thinking that pairing this with a value-based care model would have many benefits. I was wondering what you think. It, could it, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, basically just that it would lend itself well to um, being used with a, a value-based care model. Do you have any thoughts on that combination? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know if the person who asked like, could expand a little bit. Um, I think it's a great question. I'm just not capturing exactly. Yeah, yeah John. So, sorry. so I was referring to um, like a team approach for value-based care for, to cover these patients. And then we can also be monitoring them in the home, which to me is like combining both parts. And I thought that would be, um, that's kind of been the link in the chain that's been missing on, on the value-based care um, is the follow-up in the home, so. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Um, there is, we are thinking about that. Uh, Sue hasn't started, but how can we bring technology to improve that, you know, really uh, medical follow up at home of patients of more complexity? Uh, so it's in the works. I think um, I there is definitely some benefit to it. Um, so more to come in the next few years. Thank you for clarifying, John. Um, there was another question. I understand that this is a pediatric program. Have you been able to share for adult populations or to adult programs? Not yet, but I think it could be applicable to to adults too. With that, of course, we're going to have different parameters, right? Um, and adults go to work, and you know, right, they're not going to. They it's a different different dynamic, right? With adults with intestinal failure, but it's definitely applicable. You know, the, the using the example of the diabetes is interesting because that is helpful for, like if you have an adult patient with diabetes that can monitor their own data, but also for parents because um, they have access to that, which I think is fascinating. They can know what the blood sugar of the child is when they are at school. So, you know, and that, give some peace of mind, right? And then it improves care overall. So um, so there is definitely applications for, you know, that can be personalized depending on um, 
the population. Thank you. And Emily just added, it would be amazing to see this, oh, in adult programs, it would be amazing to see this paired with Bluetooth scales, similar to the ARIA scales with Fitbit. That would be really cool. Yeah, and our, our scale does that. Like, you know, the, the tube, the, the weight is transfer via Bluetooth to the, um, there is a way to enter the data too, just in case, you know, things don't work out, but uh, yes. Um, and that brings other possibilities too, right? Like you mentioned the scale, uh, you know, other things that we are improving the care of patients with intestinal failure. We are looking not only at weight, we are looking at body composition. So some of the scales could give body composition, we could track over time. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of, there's so much potential there. Very cool. Any final thoughts or questions? There's definitely a lot of potential in terms of just the development of technology too. I, I always joke, I would love a pump where I can just be like, hey Siri, turn my pump off or <laughs> hey Siri, pop the primate so I can get the air out of the line or something like that. Right, right. So much we could do. Okay. Well, we did wrap up a little bit early. Um, so if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, feel free to send Dr. Oliveira an email. Um, thank you so very much for your time. Um, our break was going to go from 12.15 to 12.30, um, but we can wrap up a little bit early. Um, and I know Thomas um, is ready to hop on a little bit early as well. All right, so I'd love if everyone could start to trickle back in and we will get ready for our next presentation. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, but um, I think between our presentations and questions, um, we'll still end at the same time. Um, so I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Thomas Hirsch, who was our one of our 2023 HPN Research Prize winners. Um, but like Dr. Oliveira did not get to join us at the annual conference. Um, because of weather and flights and all sorts of things. Um, so he is going to present his research. And um, just like before, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions afterwards, but feel free to utilize the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom. All right. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Great. Okay. Yeah, I, I was sorry not to be able to make it. Um, just weather uh, getting in the way of the flight, but I'm um, happy to be able to present now. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so my name is Thomas Hirsch, and I'm in the pewter lab at Boston Children's Hospital. And this presentation is 4% uh, TEDTA in catheter complications in a high risk population of pediatric intestinal failure patients. It is in the notes view on our end. Oh, you can see it in the notes view. Okay, here, let me turn that off. Totally fine either way. Just wanted you to be aware. Oh yeah, no, thank you. There we go. That look okay now? Looks great, thank you. Okay, it's great, yeah. Um, so we have a disclosure. Uh, Kite Lock was provided in kind by the manufacturer, Sterile Care Inc. And the outline, intestinal failure, PN, and central lines. So pediatric intestinal failure is characterized by inadequate gastrointestinal length or function to absorb the nutrients necessary to meet metabolic needs. The cause is frequently short bowel syndrome, but it can also be uh, associated with motility disorders or mucosal enteropathies. Parenteral nutrition or peeing for the patients who are unable to absorb sufficient nutrients enterly, but PN is not without its costs. PN is an intravenously administered mixture of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, micronutrients, and it was advanced by Stanley Dudrick in the 1960s. It significantly altered the course of babies born with intestinal failure. However, 
As patients lived longer, they encountered new ailments, including intestinal failure associated liver disease, which may require multivisceral transplant. SBS occurs in about 25 babies per 100,000. The most recent governmental data from 2017 in the United States estimated 4,000 pediatric patients on home PN. Patients requiring home PN are different than patients in critical care settings because the central lines are often required for years versus shorter time periods in the ICU. While catheter complications occur in the critical care setting, these events are more significant in the home PN population where long-term access is required and each line replacement risks loss of central venous access. Thus, preventing and managing these events are critical elements of intestinal failure management. Advances in the management of intestinal failure uh, are mostly related to multidisciplinary teams and the introduction of pure fish oil emulsions. This uh, was from a study that Paul Wales' team did uh, to evaluate change in outcomes for pediatric intestinal failure patients between the 1990s and the early 2000s. In a study on these interventions and their uh, impacts on clinical outcomes, uh, Oliveira et al. found that only disease-specific mortality, central line infection rate per 1,000 catheter days, and mechanical complication rate per 1,000 ca uh, catheter days decreased over the time period studied. Only omega-3 lipid introduction and multidisciplinary care teams uh, were found to significantly decrease disease-specific mortality over time. And this change was observed over a 15-year time period from 1996 to 2011. So neither ethanol locks nor bowel lengthening procedures were found to have an impact on disease-specific mortality. The central lines used in intestinal failure are tunneled and typically placed in either the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein. The two different types of catheter complications are central line-associated bloodstream infections, or mechanical complications. Intestinal failure patients are not the only patients with long-term central lines, but represent a particularly susceptible group for complications due to bowel abnormalities. Clabsies occur more frequently due to bacterial translocation from the gut and tend to be more severe and lead to sepsis more frequently. And then mechanical complications encompass occlusions, fractures, breakages, uh, Clabsies, occlusions, fractures, breakages may require line replacement. So all of these may require line replacement. Patients with Clabsy typically present with fever, chills, and a range of other symptoms, including decreased responsiveness, fatigue, abdominal pain, vomiting, dehydration, among others. And Clabsies are caused by translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream, or a break of sterility during line management. Biofilms can form, allowing bacteria to share genetic material and proliferate in a protected environment where exchange of enzymes and nutrients facilitates their proliferation. A presentation with symptoms concerning for Clabsy prompts a hospital admission where blood cultures are drawn and patients are started on prophylactic antibiotics. Under current practice, 48 hours of negative cultures are required before stopping antibiotics and sending the patient home. A proactive approach is taken given the high risk of sepsis with rapid decompensation in patients with intestinal failure. Persistent positive cultures may require removal and replacement of the catheter. The 48-hour rule-out practice is being challenged by data from our lab suggesting that 97% of blood cultures will show within 24 hours if positive. A study is underway in collaboration with the Eastern Pediatric Surgery Network to increase our sample size and potentially change this practice. Our aim is to determine one, if a 24 hour rule out would be safe compared to the, the standard 48 hour rule out. And then number two, to see what factors may predict a longer time to positivity. Mechanical complications represent the other side of the complication spectrum, aside from CLABSI, and include fractures and breakages. These often require an ED visit, and repair can occur bedside or may require operative intervention for replacement if the lines cannot be salvaged at bedside.
Occlusions are caused by coagulated blood products in the catheter and may be cleared with TPA, uh, either in the ED or some of our patients administer TPN uh, or TPA at home. So there are some new strategies for mitigating line complications. The leading strategy in line safety came from multidisciplinary care teams, often called pediatric intestinal rehabilitation. As described in the Oliviera study, multidisciplinary care is one of the two factors that have improved all-cause mortality in intestinal failure uh, patients. Advancements have come in the form of standardized management strategies, including sterility techniques and prompt CLABSI workup. Advancements have been made in materials and placement techniques, and finally, locking solutions. The Oliveira study uh, discussed earlier did not see any change in mortality from the use of ethanol locks compared to heparin, however. There are a variety of lock solutions that are used in pediatric central lines. Antibiotic locks, such as terolidine, are part of recommendations in Europe, but terolidine is not available in the United States. Sodium bicarbonate has known anticoagulant properties uh, with evidence demonstrating CLABSI reduction as well. It is cheap and widely available. Finally, 4% tetrasodium EDTA, the focus of our study, is used in Canada, Europe, and Australia, and has both antimicrobial and anticoagulant properties. So heparin is often used as the initial lock solution. It has anticoagulant properties, but no antimicrobial properties. Patients who are considered high risk for CLABSI uh, with at least one previous CLABSI episode require prophylactic lock solution like ethanol lock therapy, something that's antimicrobial. While ethanol lock is antimicrobial, which is considered a benefit, there is concern uh, for catheter uh, breakage due to precipitation of proteins that increase flush pressure in the when the line is being is being flushed. And this is a concern that's been raised for ethanol lock. Terolidine is, is most commonly used in Europe for antimicrobial uh, lock solutions, um, and it's recommended by European guidelines, but it is not currently available in the United States. It works against gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, and it also works against fungi, um, and it's rapidly metabolized to CO2 and water. A retrospective cohort study on ethanol lock therapy was conducted on 122 patients at Boston Children's Hospital uh, who are enrolled at our intestinal rehabilitation program. Um, and the study was, was uh, or patient data was evaluated from 2018 to 2020. A prior meta-analysis had found that uh, ethanol lock reduced CLABSI rate by 63%, but there has been concern for increase in mechanical catheter complications at our institution during the recent ethanol lock shortage. Of the 122 patients who are enrolled, 44% uh, received ethanol lock for the entirety of the study period. That's from 2018 to 2020. 29% used only heparin locks and 27% used both ethanol at, and heparin at some time uh, during, the, during the study period. Gastroschisis was the primary cause of short bowel syndrome overall in the population. And these are the outcomes of the study. Mechanical catheter complications were evaluated as a composite outcome of catheter repairs and replacements for non clabsy mechanical indication. And during periods of ethanol lock compared with heparin, there was a 1.6 times risk of mechanical catheter complications. Catheter repairs alone, but not replacements alone, were significantly increased while on ethanol lock therapy by 2.3 times. The CLABSI outcomes were evaluated in switchers, uh, which are the patients receiving both heparin and ethanol at some point in the study. CLABSI risk was 0.45 times lower while receiving ethanol compared with heparin. This was not statistically significant. And then finally, a catheter replacement for CLABSI indication on ethanol lock was 0.06 times uh, that compared to time on heparin. So in conclusion, ethanol lock in our study increased mechanical catheter complications, 
but it appeared to decrease uh, CLABSI related complications. So there's an unmet need for antimicrobial locks in the United States, just given uh, the concerns for ethanol and also the recent shortage with ethanol uh, for high-risk patients. 4% um, EDTA has been approved in several countries and has both antimicrobial and anticoagulant uh, properties. And it works by a mechanism of calcium chelation to, uh, to prevent bacteria and prevent the formation of blood clots. First study on, uh, on EDTA in pediatric intestinal failure patients was conducted in 2020 on 20 patients. And 50% of this population was on ethanol ox before switching to EDTA. And over the time period of the study, uh, they observed a significant reduction in the incidence of CLABSIs from 2.7 per thousand catheter days to zero per thousand catheter days. So based on the promising results, and ethanol lock shortage at our institution, we initiated a compassionate use protocol. Patients considered high risk for line infections who lost access to ethanol during the shortage were offered EDTA as an alternative therapy. Patients presented for routine visits every two to four months at our rehabilitation program. They received their uh, prescription of TEDTA at these visits and underwent screening questionnaires um, and then had lab data collected to evaluate the safety um, while they were enrolled in the compassionate use protocol. The results, so in terms of demographics, most of the patients in the high-risk protocol were born premature, either premature between 32 and 36 weeks or very premature uh, before 32. At the time of enrollment, the average age was between 2 to 11 years of age. And then in terms of diagnosis, uh, the population com consisted primarily of patients with a diagnosis of short bowel syndrome. This figure sums up our experience with EDTA and the compassionate use protocol. Statistics were performed using confidence intervals to determine the differences between baseline complication rates on ethanol or heparin uh, compared to the rates after initiation of EDTA. The blue lines are the ethanol heparin and the red lines are the EDTA. Overlapping confidence intervals implies that none of the findings are statistically significant. However, the trend in patients receiving EDTA was toward fewer occlusions, replacements, CLABSIs, and repairs in addition to fewer composite outcomes, meaning that there were fewer mechanical complications or a trend toward fewer mechanical complications and a trend toward fewer total line complications. And that includes CLABSI. The table demonstrates the rates and confidence intervals for each of the outcomes. Patients spent more time overall, uh, 15,000 or over 15,000 catheter days on heparin ethanol uh, compared to EDTA. Uh, they spent 5,000 on EDTA um, during the study window. And this is why the rates were compared rather than the raw event numbers. In conclusion, 4% TEDTA reduced the composite outcome of line complications, including line repair, replacement, and CLABSI. However, results are limited by the small sample size and high-risk population. Results are also limited by improvements in management strategies, which decrease incidence of Lyme complications. And uh, finally, I think it's important to note that these patients, many of them were on ethanol lock. The EDTA is, is being compared to how the patients were performing on ethanol lock. Um, if the patients were on heparin, it was for a very brief uh, period of time. Um, so if the, if the EDTA is performing similar to or better than the um, the uh, ethanol lock, that's an important outcome. So for future directions, our goal is to continue the compassionate use protocol for patients so that they can continue to have antimicrobial prophylaxis. Further analysis of our data is, is data analysis is ongoing for, for our results that we received. And then uh, finally, the most important thing is to gather multi-center prospective data on, on TEDTA 
and how it compares in a, in a prospective study. I'd like to thank my study team uh, and thank Dr. Pewter, who was my mentor in this work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question in the chat box, could you explain what a multi-center perspective study is? Sure, yeah, that's a very good question. So um, the studies that that we had done in the that I described in, in the presentation, one of which was the recent uh, ethanol lock study where basically what happened was patients at our institution lost access to ethanol and uh, had to be started on heparin. And these were high risk patients where we had concern that they would develop central line infections. So we looked backward, collected data from the chart, and then compared, you know, for each patient, you know, what they had been on, what, what their rates were when they were on ethanol to what the rates of these complications were once they lost the ethanol. But, um, but this was all looking backward. So, you know, retrospective is the word for it, but looking backward and seeing what happened in the past to these patients. Um, the, the, the experience with the EDTA is a little different because it's a compassionate use protocol where um, we are prospectively collecting data, um, but, uh, but the patients are basically uh, given a special, special access um, to the to the EDTA. So um, we're not kind of having them in a study where they're comparing some patients who are on EDTA to some patients who are not and kind of tracking them as time progresses. Um, and that's kind of what really needs to be done for a for for EDTA is to to have to you know give some patients who are in our cohort EDTA and then give some patients ethanol or heparin and then compare, um, how patients do with their, in terms of complication rates while they're on EDTA to uh, patients who are not on EDTA. So it's basically in this study, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, it's, the patient started on EDTA and then this is what their complication rate is. And then we look backward and say like, oh, you know, at baseline when they were on ethanol, this is what, what their complication rates were. Um, and then now that they're on heparin, you know, we're tracking that same patient um, how does that compare? So it's different than a prospective kind of uh, a multi-center study. And then the multi-center component is using different institutions so that we can um, get a big cohort. Cause I think that's another issue with, with uh, our study or limitation is that it's a small cohort of high-risk patients, um, which, which makes, um, you know, the, the statistical analysis and interpreting the results a little more challenging. And it, let's see, it looks like uh, the next question is if a patient has to use and access line multiple times per day for IV hydration medications, do ethanol lock after every access? Um, so typically, I think this is the question, um, do you ethanol lock after every access? So um, it's, it's asking a question basically in, in patients who have to have the line used uh, multiple times a day, um, is ethanol lock used after each access? Um, I think it's it's you know ethanol lock is used different is used in different ways. Some patients get it three times uh, a week. Sometimes patients get it uh, every day. So we've used ethanol in different ways. Not every patient gets it you know after, every single day. Um, but that is kind of what our institution has has gravitated toward. But typically, what happens is um, the patients are. Are, are obviously they don't have the lock solution in their line while they're on the the TPN while the PN is infusing overnight. Uh, if the patient is cycled and they they you know get TPN over a twelve hour period a condensed period, um, but then once they get unattached from from PN, um, the 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 ethanol lock would get um, instilled into the line and then it would stay in for the duration of the day, um, and then if any kind of hydration is needed. Uh, most of the time, I think families will put the ethanol lock back in. Um, I think that the medications, they attempt to time them with um, the PN so that they don't have to kind of be constantly taking the ethanol uh, lock and out and, and putting it back into the line. Um, because one thing that comes up for these patients is that um, the, the use of the line is, is 
something that that is concerning um, because they uh, there can be complications that develop just from re repeated use of the line. So as little withdrawing and flushing uh, of lock solutions into the line is is better if if it can be can be arranged in that way. Um, when it comes to using these types, the, this is the next question um, from Jessica. When it comes to using these types of locks on these lines, was this study specific to a certain type of central line, Ports versus Hickman, or did it include a mix of both or more? So this is a, a good question. And I think something important because um, different lines are made of different materials and, and in different locations. And it's an important thing that that can be considered and the, the analysis can kind of be broken down based on you know, patients who have a certain type of type of line. Um, most of the, I think, I believe all the patients in the study had Broviacs. We do have all that data. Um, and then I don't think we were just given the small sample size. I don't think we'd be able to conduct a sub analysis to um, see if there was any kind of um, any kind of interaction with the type of line. But we didn't have any patient on ports and uh, we didn't have any patients with Hickman's in this population. I believe they all had Broviacs. The next question is uh, from Beth. Um, do you do you know of any options for patients to be on EDTA when they aren't near a center? I think this is a this is a good question, and this is a, an important um, talking point. I think we would uh, love for this to be more available, just because based on our experience, we feel that patients and their families seem to like EDTA compared to. Uh, ethanol, and then certainly patients who are high risk and need an antimicrobial agent, it it's, seems to be very good and comparable uh, with ethanol. And then, you know, certainly better than heparin for patients who need antimicrobial prophylaxis. But currently now, I don't think that there's any way that patients are able to, um, to get this unless they're on a study or some kind of compassionate use protocol, at least in the United States. Um, but it is approved in Canada and the EU and Australia. So um, probably easier to to access there. Um, this next uh, question is from Kathy. And uh, it is, so EDTA, what is the chance multiple children's hospitals could be involved in the EDTA, including their TPN dependent patients at home, not just those in the hospital? Um, so this is basically, uh, the way I'm interpreting this question is that if there was a, um, if there was a multi-center study, so incorporating multiple hospitals into a study, um, what is the chance that that um, uh, that you'd be able to uh, conduct a study like that using multiple hospitals where patients are receiving EDTA? Um, and I think it's a, I, I mean, it this in terms of our our experience with this compassionate use protocol at Boston Children's Hospital. I think it's been pretty smooth. Uh, patients, a lot of our patients live far away, so they have to travel to um, to come to their visits and pick up the EDTA so that they can administer it when they get home. And we've really had no, we've had no adverse events, I think is the most important thing. Um, no major adverse events. I think we've had the expected uh, line complications and, you know, we've been tracking those. But um, it, it in terms of the delivery of, of this, uh, this lock solution, it's pretty straightforward. And I think families don't tend to have an issue with it at home. So I think when it comes time and a, a multi-center study is done where multiple hospitals are involved and, um, and they, they, you know, I think that they'll have a, it'll be pretty straightforward to carry that study out and patients and families will be able to, um, will, will be able to use the EDTA without any issue at home. Um, just based on our experience that we've had here. Um, I think, you know, I, I've, I have like, you know, I speak with the families frequently when they come for their, their, you know, every two to four month monitoring visits, and they all seem to have a good experience, which that always makes us happy when we feel like patients are, are benefiting from, um, from, you know, from these studies. The next question is from Whitney. Um, with the, with patients that are uh, factor five Leiden, would there be concerns with add ion clotting, anion clotting. Um, did you have any experience with this in the limited study? This is a good question. Um, 
you know, with, with factor five lighten, they'll have an increased risk of, of clotting. And I, I, to be completely honest, I wasn't ready for this one. I don't know how factor five lighten would interact with EDTA, um, additional, um, additional clotting. Oh, big concerns with additional clotting. Um, did you have any experience with the limited study? Yeah. So we, we didn't have any patients in this study who had factor five lighten, um, diagnosis, uh, so it's a it's a very good question. I think one one way to look into this, which would be interesting, is EDTA is something that um, it's not something that's never been administered in the medical setting before. This is something that's used for can be used for lead poisoning. Um, so it would be interesting to see if there's any literature on this, if any patients with factor V Leiden have received EDTA in the past, and if there was any um, any changes there. Um, let's see. So this next question from Maisie, uh, can you just clarify when you were talking about removing ethanol or any lock in between accesses, you don't put back the same? Oh yeah, this is a good point. So yeah, if you, if a patient is, is, um, is getting, uh, medications administered through their central line, um, and the lock solution needs to be withdrawn from the line. That same lock solution, obviously, it would not be administered right back into the line because um, that would be a, an infection risk. So part of the line management that's important is that if a, the, all these these uh, medic, the uh, lock solutions are must be sterile and uh, line care, you know, must be uh, must be used when you know, the sterility care must be used when dealing with these central lines. And after aspirating, you know, ethanol, uh, if a drug needs to be given through the central line, that same ethanol would not be put back. It would be a uh, a new vial of ethanol lock that would be put back into the central line. Um, the next question is from Emily. Uh, which drug shortage, with drug shortage being a constant issue, do you predict EDTA to be more available? This is a good question. Uh, I would expect it would be more available. It's always hard to predict what is going to arise that's going to cause um, trouble with availability for any any drug. Uh, certainly, ethanol lock. I don't think that that um, we could have predicted that that would become part of a shortage for our patient population, but then it did. So it's hard to know um, what EDTA uh, what use might come up that that would result in it being limited uh, for our patient population. But so far, it's it's uh, there hasn't been issues in terms of. Uh, patients who who are using EDTA in Canada or Australia or the the European Union, from my from what I've heard. Any other question? Thank you so much for all these good questions. Happy to answer anything else as well about line care or um, our experience with EDTA. I think another thing is um, another question that comes up is just terolidine and um, Europe has a great experience with terolidine. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't have access to that as well in the United States because the data is very good. Um, and I think it's just the, the resources involved in, in starting a study can, can be pretty significant. So that's part of the, the delay, but, um, but otherwise, you know, there are, out there and these these lock solutions are very important for preventing complications that can be life threatening. So I think um, making these these lock solutions more available and just getting the knowledge out there is good. I have a question from Beth. Uh, what is the biggest complication you see for lines being long um, long term, like over five years and what proactive suggestions can we give patients? That's a very good question. Um, the biggest complication, um, I think, you know, over five years, the, the kind of the biggest concern over time, like long periods of time over five years is the risk of central venous stenosis. where just with repeated access of these, uh, these veins that the veins shrink and then it's difficult to, uh, to get, uh, to, to get access to them and that the patient loses access. I think that's the biggest concern. We don't see this frequently um, because line care is good. Patients have 
fewer replacements than they've had in the past, which decreases the risk. Um, but certainly preventing clabsies, uh, preventing um, preventing breakages, preventing uh, the need for repairs is very important to preserve these lines and preserve the veins, um, especially when you know children are young and they require these lines at such a young age that they're able to have kind of the same line as long as possible is good as, as far as they need it. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's that's nice to see is we're doing our CLABSI study looking at the 24 versus 48 hour rule out, and we see fewer uh, presentations for CLABSI now than we did in the past. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. So these it's constantly changing because of the care that we're able to provide to the patients. It, I think the most important thing is just, um, you know, is a uh, routine line care um, education for families being able to um, being able to kind of do the maintenance that they need to do at home, the cap changes, the dressing changes, and being able to do that in a sterile manner, um, and then routinely presenting for for visits um, so that the clinical staff can can assess the lines and make sure. Um, let's see. Another, I have a another couple questions. A question from Whitney: What if you can't draw the lock back out with ethanol? Some patients have to flush it through because they can't draw it back. This is a very good question, um, and something that that's actually come up for us. I think it's a, a relevant question because you know families worry about um, about you know that if they if they are drawing back the lock solution, that's going to increase the risk that the the catheter is going to break. Um, and and there there's probably some truth to that. So um, you know, with ethanol, oftentimes it does get flushed into the catheter. Um, families will flush ethanol into the catheter to prevent the need to you know aspirate it because of the the risk that or the concern that the the catheter will break. With EDTA, we have families in the protocol who who were using EDTA and worried that you know, aspirating would lead to breakage of their catheter, you know, that, 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 you know, that's happened before. And sometimes when they aspirate, it, it feel, it's kind of difficult to aspirate a little sluggish. Um, so we did allow families in our protocol to flush EDTA. We'd give some of them special permission to flush the EDTA. Uh, there are studies that suggest that this is safe. It's been uh, reported before in prior studies. I believe in the whale study that I mentioned from 2020, where um, his team looked at at EDTA and there was no issues uh, in a big cohort of patients. Um, and then I, I think there's some other study as well. I'm, I don't remember the name right now where um, there's a, a, a big sample size and there was no safety concerns with flushing EDTA. So it is something that we've allowed in our protocol and I, it's something that's safe. Um, that we haven't noticed any complications that that result because of flushing EDTA. And so for families that are concerned about catheter breakage with aspiration, flushing is an appropriate alternative for EDTA. And it may even be, you know, better to flush EDTA than than ethanol. Um, I think those are things that I don't know how many studies have been done comparing, you know, flushing EDTA versus flushing ethanol, but it'd be interesting. Um, a question. So uh, is there any association between use of antibiotic locks and an increase in occlusions? Um, use of antibiotics and increase in occlusions. They're usually heparinized now, but I've heard some instances of this happening. This is a very good question. We've had a lot. So both in the, the uh, ethanol lock study that we did, where we looked back at the patients who uh, were on ethanol, lost access, and then needed to be on heparin. Um, and then in the, uh, the, in our study where we, uh, did the compassionate use protocol for EDTA. We have tracked occlusions in both of those. Um, and there doesn't, uh, I think um, EDTA is antimicrobial, but also, you know, was looked, had a trend toward a decrease in occlusions, but occlusions in general are, are hard to study. And I think it was something that we, we ran into uh, with our retrospective study, just because um, some patients, uh, are, or some families are given a TPA and it's unclear how often that gets used in the, you know, looking back at the medical record, it's hard to track. Um, if a patient's family is given, you know, 30 
doses of TPA, how many times did they use it? It's not always reported. Um, for some patients, it's very clear if they present to clinic and they have a, an occlusion at the line sluggish, they have an occlusion and there's a report in the, in the visit note that that TPA was given, it can be very clear, but I think it is hard to know. Um, it is hard to know uh, exactly how many occlusions um, are happening. I think I'll, I can pull up this here. This was just sharing the slide from my PowerPoint. This was um, the retrospective study we did looking at ethanolock and for catheter occlusions between the ethanol and the heparin group, um, there was no significant difference um, but that's something that uh, I think it's hard to study and it's it's uh, it's hard to know how well that's being tracked. And um, it's it's definitely something that as we uh, were working on that project, we were thinking about, you know, ways that that this could be tracked or easy, easier ways to track the use of the TPA. But it, it was just difficult because so I guess just to jump back and explain a little bit, TPA is administered. Um, when there is a is is kind of frequently administered when there is a concern for a, a a blockage in the catheter or an occlusion, a blood clot that's not going to clear otherwise. So um, sometimes when when families have never had a, a blockage before, um, they'll come to clinic and TPA will be given in the clinic to see if 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 TPA is left in the line, if it will break up that clot, and um, and then the catheter will flush smoothly again. Um, because having that clot in there can increase the risk of a fracture, um, a breakage of the line. But if um, if uh, if um, if uh, sorry, if uh, if TPA is is um, if, if a family has recurrent um, issues with these occlusions and uh, TPA needs to be used more frequently. Uh, prescriptions will be given so that they can go home with TPA and administer it at home, but then it becomes difficult to track. So for patients who, especially those that have a lot of occlusions, that can be hard to monitor because they're the ones that end up having the TPA and going home with the TPA. And then um, it's a little difficult. Sometimes that visits patient get asked how many, but you know, in doing a prospective study, this would be something that would be easier to track. But in doing a retrospective study, it's something that is a little more difficult to follow. So the next question I have is, here is, um, you've mentioned high-risk patient. Um, how does your team define that? Um, we did not have a... Uh, so we did not have a... Um, kind of official definition for high-risk patient. We did have inclusion and exclusion criteria um, in our protocol for the compassionate use protocol for patients receiving EDTA. Um, but uh, I think most, all of the patients enrolled needed to be high-risk, meaning high-risk for CLABSI, so for essential line infection. And that means that they were on ethanol lock and lost access and um, what this means for for our the patients in our at our institution is that they've had at least one CLABSI in the past. They get started on ethanol locks, um, and that that is kind of the definition of of a of a high risk patient. I guess is that uh, it's a patient at high risk of having a CLABSI. Um, that's the straightforward answer. Um, but I think you know there are other things, other variables that can factor into to high risk patient, um, but some patients on our protocol had uh, many presentations for central line um, infections, you know, in the past, and some of them just had a couple and then didn't have any throughout that are time on EDTA. So, um, you know, it, it was a kind of a diverse population with different presentation, um, different numbers of presentations. Um, part of the analysis that we plan to do is some sensitivity analysis, looking at different, um, different results. If, if, you know, for example, if, if certain patients trying to isolate risk factors and see if there's anything that we can learn from our our um, our data. Uh, so the next question is: Are there any concerns with the use of EDTA uh, long term in patients? Um, there are no concerns for long term use um, that that I know of, and this is uh, it's not a lock solution that's been used you know as long as something like heparin. Um, but uh, from 
the data out so far, there's nothing to suggest that it would be um, concerning for long-term use, especially since uh, most of it is is just dwelling inside of the central line. So once the central line is measured uh, for how for the length, including the internal length, the lock solution is sitting in the line, and it shouldn't. Some of it will go into um, it will, will you know flush and go into the systemic circulation, but um, but you know not and and certainly some families will probably end up flushing it. Uh, centrally, depending on you know how difficult their catheter is to work with, but um, but there's no concern that that small volume over a long period of time would result in any harm to the child. Any final questions? Tom, is there a way that they can reach you if they have any follow-up questions or anywhere they can go for more information? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can post my email address in the chat. Yeah, that that's would... okay. Or, yeah. That'd be awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing absolutely. your information. We're so yeah. sad we couldn't have you join us at the annual conference. I, I was really, I was really, I was, <laughs> I was at the airport and then I was on the plane and then it was like three hours on the plane and then we thought we would take off and then just didn't. <laughs> yeah, it was, you were not so alone. It was unfortunate. I was really, I was really hoping I could make it and, um, but I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to present, but yeah, maybe yeah. next year. <laughs> we're so grateful and congratulations on being our HPN research prize winner. Oh, of course, thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much. Is everyone able to see my email? Yep, I think we're good. All right, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, obviously feel free to reach out with anything and thank you. And thank you all for your questions. Thank you so much. So we're going to um, shift gears a little bit early now. Um, let me see. Um, and I am going to turn the floor over to Jared Garnica with Takeda and he is going to introduce our next speakers. Excellent. Thank you, Macy. Hi, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us during today's uh, only mini-meeting mini -meeting presentation about getting to know a short bowel treatment option with Dr. Kimberg and caregiver Kelsey. Um, as Macy said, my name is Jared Garnica, and I'm a Takeda employee that helps to, to put this program together. And yeah, we wanted to begin by thanking you to, for taking time to come and to learn about short bowel syndrome or SBS and a treatment option. And, and we, we hope that, that you find the, the information that, that we share today informational and valuable. Um, our presentation is intended for educational purposes only. So should you have any medical related questions, please reach out to, to your doctor. And on behalf of the Short Bowel Syndrome Marketing Team, I'm very excited to, to introduce today's speakers. During the next hour, you will be hearing from Dr. Savan Kimberg, who, who will lead our educational presentation. Uh, after which we will hear fr from Kelsey, and then we will open it up to, to any questions that, that you might have. So by, by way of introduction, Dr. Kimberg joins us from Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York, where she is the director of PD, uh, director at the Pediatric Intestinal Reha Rehabilitation Center. She's also assistant professor of pediatrics and biomedical and informatics in the division of pediatric gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition. And Dr. Kimberg is also extremely active and accomplished in her field. She has presented and co-authored posters at international, national, and regional and annual professional society meetings. She is board certified, certified in pediatrics, pediatric gastroenterology, 
and clinical inf informatics, and she has led and co-authored peer review articles in various publications. And Kelsey, our caregiver, joins us from California. She is a full-time caregiver and a devoted mother who is caring for her young daughter, Penelope. So you'll, you'll hear more a bit about that. And Penelope is living with short bowel syndrome. She will also, she, Kelsey will generously share some of the insights of what it's like being a, a full-time caregiver to someone living with SDS. So I will now hand it off to Dr. Kimberg. Thank you so much, Jared. And thank you so much to Oli and to Takeda for inviting me to speak to you all today about short bowel syndrome and GATEX or to duglutide. So just to start off with some disclosures, this program is being sponsored by Takeda. I am presenting on behalf of Takeda as a consultant and receiving compensation for my time. And all of the information that will be contained within this presentation is consistent with FDA guidelines. So I'm just gonna start off with an overview of what GATEX is, and we'll, we'll go into more detail about this in the second half of the talk. But GATEX or Tuduglutide is a subcutaneous injection that is prescribed um, and it's used for children and adults one year of age and older who have short bowel syndrome and need additional fluids or nutrition from what we call parental support. And this is anything that's delivered through the intravenous route, such as uh, intravenous fluids or total parental nutrition, TPN. Um, GATEX has not been studied in children less than one year of age, so it's not currently approved for, for that population just yet. And there's some important safety information which we'll go through in more detail, but just to give you an overview, GATEX has been associated with some serious side effects, and these include making abnormal cells grow faster, polyps in the colon or the large intestine, blockage or obstruction of the intestines, swelling or inflammation, or blockage of the gallbladder or pancreas, and fluid overload. And again, I'll go into much more detail about all of these. So this is an overview of today's program. We're gonna start off just by talking about what short bowel syndrome is. We'll go into more detail about GATEX, and I'll share some data from the clinical studies with you. And then we'll have an overview of the One Path um, Patient Services Program. And as Jared said, you will then hear from our caregiver, Kelsey, who will share um, her and her child's journey. And we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So just to start off with an overview of short bowel syndrome, many of you know kind of what it is, but we still kind of argue about what the definition is. So we define short bowel syndrome as a chronic malabsorption disease. Um, and in children, it typically occurs either when part of the intestine is surgically removed or children can be born missing that part of the intestine. Um, and the result of this is that they're not able to absorb enough nutrients and food from what they're taking by mouth or through a feeding tube. And this results in, in malabsorption. So kind of the overview of short bowel syndrome, kind of the definition, any missing part of the small intestine that results in malabsorption. And if untreated, it puts children at risk for malnutrition, dehydration, electrolyte disturbances, and diarrhea or increased outputs um, from either feeding tubes or from stomas. And there are multiple things that go into making this diagnosis. One of them is the length of the intestine. We used to fixate a lot more on the exact amount of centimeters left. And now we've moved away from that exact definition to incorporating children that might also have a functional component because you might have enough technically centimeters of bowel remaining, but if the function is not good and you're not absorbing well, you still fall under this umbrella term of short bowel syndrome. And what happens when you've lost that part of the intestine? So the intestine is actually very smart and it tries to go to compensate for the part that was lost. And we call this process adaptation. It's a natural process that occurs after part of this small intestine or large intestine was taken out where the bowel actually makes changes to itself and it learns to absorb better. This whole process is stimulated by us feeding the gut. So either nutrition by mouth or through a feeding tube. And sometimes children are not able to have that stimulation early on, or even if they are, the bowel might just not respond as well as we would like it to. And they might end up being dependent on long-term parental support or TPN for their nutrition and fluid needs. So there are different types of parental support that we can provide to children. And this is a recipe that we make that is individualized to the child. Um, when you're in the hospital, it's made on a daily basis. When you go home, we to tweak the, the recipe kind of every week or every couple of weeks. And we're able to provide a mix of protein, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. And again, individualized to what the child needs, depending on what they're taking by mouth, what they're absorbing, what their blood values show, um, and what their weight gain is. And 
it's a mix of just providing some hydration, so that's intravenous fluids, or we can provide all of the nutrition that a child needs and the child can be fully dependent on TPN. And you can see on the image here on the right that it's going to vary and it usually starts off by having the TPN every single day for 24 hours. And then we slowly try to cut it down, going to just kind of overnight TPN and then hoping to achieve some less volume and some days off of TPN. Our goals for children with short bowel syndrome involve intestinal rehabilitation. And this is a process where we work together as a multidisciplinary team. Um, and you, depending on where your child follows, that team might be a little bit different, but usually there's a, a pediatric gastroenterologist or a pediatric surgeon who is leading that team. We work very closely with nurses and nurse practitioners, dietitians, pharmacists, and a social worker. And the reason that we work together as a team is because we know there's so much that goes into caring for a child with short bowel syndrome. It's not just the nutrition, it's not just the medical aspect. We really wanna take care of your child as a whole. And our goals are to work together and with you. you, you and your child are central to that team as well. But our goals are to maintain the essential nutrition and hydration. We wanna promote this natural process of intestinal adaptation. So trying to stimulate the intestines as much as we can by increasing feeds by mouth, increasing feeds through a feeding tube, and that allows us to then wean the, the parental support and give less TPN, less fluids. And our ultimate goal is to improve the child and the, the family's daily life, to teach them healthy habits, to make sure the child is sleeping well, going to school, socializing with their peers, and for you as the caregivers as well, making sure that you are able to also take care of yourself. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to talk about an important hormone, which is GLP-2. So this is stands for glucagon-like peptide 2, and it's a hormone that's produced in the intestine. And you can see in the image over here on the, on the right, we have these little cells called L cells. These cells are present in the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine or the colon. And when we eat food, those L cells get stimulated and they produce this GLP-2 hormone. And what GLP-2 does is it, it stimulates the villi in the small intestine. So some of you may be familiar with this term, but the villi are these finger-like structures. So when we go through the intestine, you can imagine that they're fingers inside. I'm using my, my, my fingers to demonstrate, but they're fingers inside and they absorb, they grab onto all the nutrients and the fluid. We want those fingers to be nice and long. We want the spaces in between to be nice and deep. We call those the crypts and we refer to the length of the villi as kind of the length of the fingers. So GLP-2 is important for making sure those villi are long and that those crypts are deep. And that results in an increased surface area so that the villi can absorb all of the nutrition and, and the, the fluid from what we're eating. The GLP-2 also plays an important role in increasing blood flow to the intestine. So it stimulates the intestines again to work better. So together with promoting the length of the villi, the increase in those, in those crypts and the increased blood flow, that is what helps us absorb um, the nutrients and the fluid that we are eating by mouth or through a feeding tube. What happens in short bowel syndrome? We know part of the intestine is removed. And with that part of the intestine that is removed, you might be missing some of those L cells. Again, going back to the previous image where you had a lot of L cells in short bowel syndrome, you're missing some of those L cells. Every child is different. So every child you know, has a different part of the intestine that was removed. So they're gonna have a different amount of L cells, different amount of the ability to make GLP-2. But we know that in general, when a child has short bowel syndrome, they have less L cells, less GLP-2. So what happens? they're able to absorb less, right? And that, that makes sense. And that's what we see with the diarrhea, the increased outputs. So shifting over to talk about GATEX, again, reminding you the GATEX or tuduclotide is a subcutaneous injection. Um, and this is still very similar to the naturally produced GLP-2 of the body, um, but it's prescribed for children and adults over one year of age who have short bowel syndrome and are dependent on any form of parental support, so any form of IV nutrition or fluids. And we'll go through the, the side effects in more detail now. So the first side effect that you need to be aware of is that GATEX can potentially make abnormal cells grow faster. So this is a little scary to some people, right? And I want you just to take a moment to understand that it's we're not saying that it's going to take normal cells and make them abnormal. But if you have abnormal cells that are already present in the body, GATEX or GLP-2 is a growth hormone and it could potentially make them grow. And we are aware that that is a potential risk and that's why you need very close monitoring by your medical team when, when your child is on GATEX. Because um, there is an increased risk that those cells could turn into cancer. 
Um, and because of this, um, we really monitor very closely. And if a child does develop a new form of cancer, we stop the, the GATX. Polyps in the colon have been associated with GATX as well. And this is why your healthcare provider will do testing before you start GATX and after starting GATX. So in kids, before starting GATX, we do an occult blood test. So that's taking the poop and checking it quickly in the office to see if there's any blood that you can't see. So that's why we call it occult blood testing. If it's positive and we don't have an explanation for why there might be blood in the stool, then we would do a colonoscopy before starting GATX looking for any polyps. If we find any polyps, we remove them. And what are these polyps that I'm talking about? So these polyps are abnormal tissue that can form in the large intestine primarily. And at the end of one year of treatment with GATX, everyone should undergo a colonoscopy to check for these polyps. And if, again, if we find them, we remove them. And there, every year thereafter, it's very important to check the stool for this occult blood again. So again, checking for any blood that you might not see. If we don't have an explanation for it, we repeat the colonoscopy. And then after five years, let's say the, the stool tests were, have been normal for five years. After five years, we should do another colonoscopy to check again for these polyps. And if at any point we find them, uh, we should stop GATX. The next potential complication is blockage or obstruction of the intestines. This can potentially happen because we are causing those villi to grow. Um, so a blockage will prevent food, gas, and fluid from going through the intestines. So it's important that you be aware of these symptoms so that you can let your healthcare provider know if your child experiences any of these things. So symptoms of an obstruction could be trouble passing stool. So you're, usually your child, you know, if they have stool three times a day and suddenly you see it slowing down, you wanna contact your healthcare provider. If they're not able to pass gas, if you notice swelling or distension of the abdomen, nausea or vomiting, and vomiting that we're concerned about is especially bilious vomiting. So that's vomiting of a green color. That's a sign that the bile is not going through down the intestines. And if your child has a stoma, um, the, the potential complications are a little bit different because you can visually see the stoma growing when we're treating with GATX. Again, it's stimulating those villi, it's stimulating the intestine to grow. And because that stoma is outside of the body, you will see it. And there are times where that stoma can grow so much that it can get narrowed down and it can get occluded. So if you're noticing that your child is not putting out any ostomy out, but you have to let your provider know. And usually these um, conditions will resolve just by, by pausing GATX temporarily and often we're able to restart it. The next concern is inflammation or blockage of the gallbladder or the pancreas. Um, and we are again aware that this is a potential complication. So we do blood monitoring. So we check the child's um, liver tests, gallbladder tests, pancreas tests before starting GATX and every six months thereafter. But if your child is having any symptoms that the gallbladder could be involved or the pancreas, then you have to let your healthcare provider know so that we can test for these conditions sooner. Um, some of these symptoms include pain in the belly uh, for pancreatitis, especially it's gonna be pain in the top part of the belly that tends to go towards the back like a belt. Um, your child might have fever, chills, a change in stool pattern, nausea, vomiting, dark urine or yellowing of the skin or the whites of the eyes um, that could suggest that there's a problem with the liver and the gallbladder. So again, just be aware of these things so that you can let your provider know if your child ever experiences this. And then if this were to happen, we would stop GATX and the decision to continue would be a joint discussion uh, with you and your healthcare provider. So this is an image of what GATX looks like. So as I mentioned before, um, it's very similar to the naturally occurring GLP-2. The one change is this second amino acid. Um, we actually changed it when making GATX to make the naturally occurring GLP-2 last a little bit longer. Um, so it doesn't last as long naturally in our bodies and having a kind of what we call an analog of GLP-2, we made it last a little bit longer just by changing that, that one amino acid, but it's otherwise very similar to the naturally occurring GLP-2. And I'm going to go through some of the studies um, looking at how GATX compares to naturally occurring GLP-2 and what some of the outcomes are. So the first study was done in adults, um, and this is what we call a proof of concept study, kind of to see if the GATX, the GLP-2 analog, works similarly to naturally occurring GLP-2. So this was a study that involved 17 adults with short bowel syndrome, and they looked at their baseline TPN volume um, at the beginning and then 21 days later, and looked at biopsies of the small intestine at baseline and 21 days later. The patients were on three different doses of GATX, so 0.03, 0.05, and 
0.1 or 0.15 milligrams per kilo. And just to give you some reference, the dose that we use for GATEX is 0.05, so kind of in, in the middle between the, the lower and the higher doses over here. The injections are given under the skin, so it's a subcutaneous injection. And all patients knew they were getting GATEX, so this was not what we consider a blinded study. Everybody knew they were on it. And the end results showed that in the higher two dose groups, so the 0.1 and the 0.15 milligrams per kilo per day group, there was increased absorption of um, fluid by the intestines of up to a liter per day, which is quite significant. And you think, you think about, again, this is only a three-week study. Um, an increased surface area of the intestines, so those villi that I mentioned before, those fingers actually got a little bit longer, and these crypts got a little bit deeper. So when the villi are longer, the crypts are deeper, the intestines can, can work to uh, much better to absorb the, the nutrients and the fluid from what we're giving by mouth or through a feeding tube. So now I'm going to shift to talk about the pediatric study. Um, we were actually a part of this study at Columbia. And so we looked at children um, up to age 17 years who had short bowel syndrome and were dependent on parental support. And the, the main goal that we, we wanted to see in this study was were we able to decrease the weekly volume of their parental support by at least 20%. Um, and for those that are discussing GATEX with their providers, you might hear this talked about frequently that 20% um, increase because when, in all of these studies, that's really the, the primary outcome. So we had 59 children enrolled um, and children could choose to either receive GATEX or continue in standard of care. When we're talking about clinical studies, standard of care means that we're continuing their clinical care as if they weren't part, in, part of a study. So we're continuing to give them their TPN and their enteral feeds um, as is kind of. And then the children that chose to participate in the GATEX study were randomized in a double blind matter. So what does that mean? So randomized meaning we're kind of choosing randomly who goes into which group. Double blind means that the patients were blinded to what dose they were getting and the clinicians were also blinded. Um, so until the study ended, we didn't know who was in which group. And the two groups were divided into 0.025 milligrams per kilo per day and 0.05 milligrams per kilo per day. And again, reminding you that the recommended dose that we use is this, this one in the middle over here, the 0.05 milligrams per kilo per day. Nine children chose to remain in the standard of care group only. And we also looked at the safety of um, GATEX in this study. And all children had short bowel syndrome and were dependent on parental support. So we'll shift to talk about the outcomes. So we were able to see that GATEX was associated with a decrease in volume we were able, and I'll go into the numbers in a second, but we were able to decrease the weekly volume of the parental support that they needed. We were able to give some children less time on parental support. So I always find this a very important outcome. So giving either less hours or less days of TPN. And then the ultimate goal, some children were able to achieve complete freedom from parental support with GATEX um, in this six month study. So going to talk about the actual numbers that we found. So Many children responded to GATEX and 69%, so 18 out of 26 of the children in the study, were able to decrease their parental support volume by at least 20% from the beginning to until six months. What I actually think is more interesting is that we saw a sustained reduction over time. So it's not like at the two months mark, the TPN volume was decreased and that was it. When you look at the study, it's really continuously over time, over that six months period that we were able to decrease the TPN volume. And by six months, on average, children were able to decrease their parental support volume by 42%, which comes out to 23 ml per kilo per day. And looking at time, which again, I think is, is one of the biggest things that we really care about um, and that, that can, can impact your day-to-day -day life, 38% um, of the children were able to decrease their parental support by at least one day per week. So having that one day off makes a huge difference. And then by six months, on average, children were able to cut down their PN volume by um, about three hours. Again, makes a big difference in the day-to-day -day of, of, of TPN administration when you don't have to be at home for, let's say, that full 12 hours. Now you can only, you only need to be at home for those for, for around nine, nine hours. And then looking at our ultimate outcome, three out of the 26 children by six months were able to come off of parental support complete. What are some of the side effects? So I mentioned before some of the more serious ones. There are some more common side effects that occur. 
Um, and these have been studied in adults and they've been studied in children in um, two clinical studies. The side effect profile is very similar to what we see in adults. The most common things are abdominal pain, distension, and nausea. This tends to occur in the first couple of weeks of starting GATEX. Now, some people might not have any side effects at all, but it is important to be aware that your child might experience some of these side effects as, as, the, as the body is getting used to these medications. Um, and over time, a lot of times the body does get used to it and that abdominal pain, nausea, and distension will go away. If it doesn't, you should talk to your healthcare provider. There are certain things that we can do to tweak either the dosing or, or the timing of the, of the medication. And if any of these symptoms don't go away, so we, we know that they can exist, but if your child is having severe abdominal pain, severe distension, any severe complaints, make sure your healthcare provider is aware of that. One other side effect that can occur is fluid overload. Why might this potentially occur? So again, GATEX is, is mimicking the body's own GLP-2 hormone, which helps the intestine absorb better. So if I'm giving your child a liter of parental support, and now they are absorbing so much more from what they're eating or drinking by mouth, or they're taking in more, it makes sense that they could potentially get too much fluid because they're getting the same amount through the parental support and their intestines are absorbing so much better. If this does occur, it tends to happen around like the three to four week mark. So you wanna make sure that around that time of starting GATEX, you are checking in with your provider. So making sure that they are doing some kind of visit with you, making sure that they are seeing you. Um, checking a weight. And if you notice that your child's you know, eyes are getting puffy, that the face is getting puffy, the ankles, um, the feet, the genitals, or the child is gaining weight very quickly, those are signs of that it's actually water weight that they are gaining. And you want to make sure that you're talking to your healthcare provider. If a child has any um, heart problems to begin with, we have to be a little bit more cautious with giving them potentially too much fluid and heart failure has um, been associated with GATEX in some of the studies. So again, just making sure that you are in very close communication with your provider. And if your child does have any symptoms of fluid overload, that is a sign for your provider to decrease the volume that we're giving in the TPN. And again, it's a sign that, that the medication is doing its job and it's working. Other things that are very important to know, especially when you're having that initial discussion, because it does change the way that we as, we as providers monitor your child. So if your child has a history of any forms of cancer, if they've had polyps, those are again, those abnormal growths that occur in the intestines. If they have heart problems, high blood pressure, any problems with the gallbladder, pancreas or kidneys, we need to make sure that we are aware of that and that might change how often we do that, those monitoring lab values. Um, we don't know uh, the safety of GATEX for an unborn child. So it's not recommended right now to become pregnant while on GATEX. So this becomes important, especially in our adolescents and young adults, so making sure that they are aware of this um, and we, ha we have to monitor them for pregnancy while they're on GATEX and making sure that if they, they are sexually active, they are using protection. So it is a discussion that we do need to have with them. Breastfeeding is also not recommended. Uh, we don't know if GATEX passes into breast milk, so we don't recommend breastfeeding during treatment with GATEX. And then the other very important thing for us to know is what other medications does your child take? So we as gastroenterologists, as, as surgeons, we tend to focus on the GI tract and we know that your child might be on other things. So either things that are prescribed or over-the-counter medications. It's very important for us to know that what your child is taking. So that's why at every visit, we go through your medication list and we ask you exactly what you're taking. Is there anything new that was pres prescribed by a different doctor? Did you buy some supplements over-the-counter? And, and this is important because again, GATEX makes things absorb, get absorbed much better. So the same way that it absorbs fluid and nutrition, it can make medications be, be absorbed a little bit better too. So for example, if your child is taking a seizure medication and the dose has been stable and no one has checked it in a while, if we're starting them on GATEX, that medication level actually might be too high for them with time if the medication is getting absorbed much better. So we have to make sure that we are aware of that and also make sure that you're talking to your other providers. So if the child again has a, a neurologist, a is on um, different like blood thinners and certain medications, making sure that we are aware of that and that we're talking to them and seeing if we need to monitor the medication. So checking the drug level or making any adjustments um, to those other medications. And I definitely, definitely have seen that. And again, it's a sign that the medication is doing its job and, and is working much better. Um, and if you do notice any potential side effects, you know, make sure that you are communicating them with, with your healthcare provider. And I'd like to turn it back over to Jared right now to, to share with us about one path. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kimberg. Uh, before I hand over the mic to to Kelsey, I wanted to go over 
one path patient services as well as additional service, uh, resources that that you can so that you can continue your 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 learning about SBS and GATEX. So one path is a program that by Takeda that's designed to support you throughout your 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 treatment journey or your child's treatment journey. And th this is a complementary service provided by Takeda to to patients that are that are currently on therapy. And this this product support program is is for eligible eligible patients and their families who who might need access and reimbursement assistance with their prescribed Takeda product. And um, something else to know about uh, One Path is that a dedicated patient support manager or a PSM, what we call, and a dedicated onboarding and access specialist work one-on-one -on -one to help patients get access to treatment. And if you want to learn more about One Path, you can either call the number that's here on the screen or you can visit the website onepath.com. And there are four big categories which One Path provides support. So they, One Path assists with patients and caregivers throughout the entire process of ac accessing their treatment. One Path also helps to navigate insurance coverage and identify financial assistance options, as well as coordinate medication delivery and nurse training if requested. And finally, it helps to support patients and caregivers and office staff with ongoing treatment access needs. So as I mentioned earlier, you can learn more by visiting the website onepath.com or by calling the, the phone number there. And our the OnePath PSMs or patient support managers are available Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And in terms for additional resources about GATEX, you can visit GATEX.com, which is our website that contains educational resources, discussion guides that you can use with your child's doctor. And so visit GATEX.com can help you stay informed. You can like us on Facebook and connect with others in the SBS community, as well as uh, stay connected through uh, other organizations such as OLE and, and NORD or rarediseases.org. Uh, additionally, I am putting a resource guide that you can uh, link in the chat. Hold on, I am also putting a link in the chat for a resource guide that, that you can download and take, take download it and take it with you so that you can uh, continue learning about SBS and GATEX. So with that said, I will now pass it to, to Kelsey. Hi everyone. Thank you for having me here. I've been in the same place as a lot of you. I'm really excited to um, share Penelope's story. <clears throat> there we go. <laughs> It came to me then that every plan is a tiny prayer to father time. I was sitting in a cold hospital waiting room, anxiously waiting as my baby daughter was being operated on, listening to music that was curated for my listening pleasure long before my plans took a turn down a different path. My feeble attempt to distract me from the fear and worry as much as possible. The song's initial verse resonated. <clears throat> Ironically, it is in a song about waiting while someone you love is ill. It's become a leitmotif that still plays in my head, even without actual audible sound filling my ears. It came to me at that precious moment how futile it is to assert control over one's life and destiny, to count on any eventuality. This applies to the good and not so good in equal measure. Hi guys, my name is Kelsey, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Takeda for inviting me here to share my story about being a caregiver to my daughter, Penelope, who's living with short bowel syndrome or SBS and being treated with GATEX. <clears throat> plans. I never realized what a privilege it was to be able to make plans freely and frequently and to be able to stick to them. Yes, I use the word privilege to be able to navigate life free from worry, free from the impact that arbitrary and unexpected events can have on one's choices is something we should never take for granted. From the time I was a child, I loved making plans. No matter what, I had everything all thoughtfully choreographed. I was a planner. Don't get me wrong, I was spontaneous too, but I like to get everything set first. 
But you know, something happens as you grow up and grow closer to adulthood. You realize that not everything goes the way you planned, the way you imagined, the way you wanted. I wanted to go to one college, but I ended up at another. I never expected to meet my partner, but I did in a freezer of the market where we both happened to work. We were each listening to the exact same song at the same time on our separate devices. What are the odds? Certainly I could not have planned that one. I never planned to have children early either, but it happened when I was 22. This is how life moves. Plan all you want. Good luck with that. Penelope Rose, born in July of 2018, my second child. Planned, anticipated, no worries, just joy ahead. A new addition to our little team of adventurers. A future filled with well-planned, spontaneous trips to all sorts of places. The way it was for me when I was a child. The way I expected it to be for my own child. It was my second pregnancy. I was prepared. I was ready. My mother and I went together to my 20-week ultrasound, a routine visit to check on things and to find out whether I was having a boy or a girl. Our technician was doing the routine anatomy scan. Everything was going great. Mom and I got the wonderful news that I was having a little girl. Perfect. My son would have a baby sister. The scanning continued, as did the upbeat and happy energy in the room. Then out of nowhere, silence. The tension of quiet concern made me aware immediately that something was wrong. The doctor was summoned. She told us that there were large dilated loops of bowel present on Penelope's ultrasound images. It could mean nothing, she said. Of course, that's what I wanted to hear, wanted to believe. I would come to find out that it meant more than any of us had ever imagined. Penelope ended up coming almost two months premature, weighing a little over five pounds. At only 12 hours old, she endured surgery that was supposed to take two hours, but took nearly five. When the surgeon came to speak to us afterwards, I knew immediately from the look on her face that bad news was clinging to her. And it was. She told us that Penelope had a mid-gut volvulus and multiple intestinal atresias, which had left her with only nine centimeters of small intestine. She was diagnosed with short bowel syndrome, something I had never even heard of, but would come to know intimately over the next few years. I was told that she would be reliant on machines, tubes, and lines for her nutrition, probably for the rest of her life. I was devastated. To be honest, that first year of her life remained somewhat of a blur, in the blink of an eye, I was thrown into the role of being a medical mom. I became a nurse overnight, in a sense, and I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was that I had to help my baby. The learning curve is steep when you have a child with a central line who is on total parental nutrition, TPN, a type of parental support. I'd never even heard of it before. <laughs> no one can really prepare you for the complete and total shock that comes with receiving such a devastating diagnosis for your child. But that's what happened. Within days, as I was still recovering from childbirth, I was being trained. Sterile technique, proper line care, dressing change procedures, G-tube feeding, IV nutrition management. Wait a minute, I never planned for this. My tiny baby girl spent four weeks in the NICU. We went home with Penelope on both G-tube feeds and TPN for 24 hours each day. The first few months were the hardest. We were in and out of the hospital countless times and came to know the nursing staff in the emergency room very well. However, despite it all, she persevered. She grew bigger and stronger and she made quick and steady progress. By Penelope's first birthday, she was only on TPN and G-tube feeds overnight and was able to spend her days line free. It was in June of 2020 that Penelope's doctor first discussed adding Gatex for sub-Q injection to her routine. He explained that Gatex is a prescription medicine used in adults and children one year of age and older with short bowel syndrome who need additional nutrition or fluids from IV feeding or parental support. It's not known if Gatex is safe and effective in children under one year of age. We talked about the potential benefits and risks, including the serious side effects like making abnormal cells grow faster, bowel blockage, and fluid overload. Together, my doctor and I decided that Penelope should start Gatex. Once our doctor completed the paperwork to start therapy, everything fell into place. Right from the start, we were able to connect with our one path patient support manager who guided us through the next steps. She arranged for a nurse to come to train and talk me through the process of how to prepare 
measure the dose and give Penelope the injection the correct way. It was helpful to have the support and to know that if I had a question, there's someone I could go to and still do sometimes. <laughs> Penelope, like she always does, took it in stride. By her second birthday, Gatex was a part of our daily regimen. Over the next few months, we were gradually able to reduce her TPN volume and calories. And by May of 2021, she was able to have one day off from TPN each week. As Penelope continued to make progress, she was able to have more nights free from TPN and was able to stop it completely by her third birthday. Her line was removed in September of 2021. For the first time ever, I felt comfortable letting her take a bath. She loved it. This is just my child's experience. Yours may be different. Penelope, or Yeppy, as she calls herself, is now five years old. <laughs> she has such a positive attitude despite the daily medical cares, procedures, and occasional hospital stays. She's silly and funny. She loves music, and with the help of Gatex, has more time to play and sing at the top of her lungs like many a typical toddler. She's incredibly strong and brave, and I'm in awe of her every day. As Penelope's gotten older, we've started making plans again, but I've learned from experience that when you have a child with a chronic illness, plans are a privilege. We've often had to cancel activities due to unforeseen illnesses or hospitalizations. When she still had the central line, we couldn't make plans that had to do with water or beaches without carefully considering the safety implications of such trips. So often our plans have had to revolve around medical supply deliveries, dressing changes, or procedures, rather than simpler things like packing for vacation. Sure, our types of plans had to be changed, but through it all, we've learned to find joy in the mundane and simple things that we get to experience every day. Extravagant trips or extended vacations have had to take the back seat, but we came to enjoy going to the playground or having a picnic in the backyard. Just being home together and not in the hospital is wonderful too. And to be honest, the small things are really beautiful and fulfilling. We have hoped that Penelope will continue to progress on Gatex now that her central line has been removed. We also hope to gain more freedom in our daily lives. No matter what, we'll continue to enjoy the small moments and not take a single one for granted. Thank you. Kelsey, thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. You're welcome. Beautiful and intimate story about you and, and Penelope. Um, we hope that everyone ha has found Dr. Kimberg's presentation insightful and educational and Kelsey's story, story insightful as well. We will now open it up, up uh, to any questions that anyone might have. Looks like Michelle has her hand raised. Michelle, are you able to unmute yourself? I can. I didn't mean to raise my hand. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question or to type it in the chat, whichever you prefer. So there's a question um, from Andrea. What is your experience, Dr. Kimberg, with getting GATEX approved and getting it to patients? So thank you for that question. So I think it, it really depends on your child's insurance. So I, I have found that that has changed throughout the last four years that, that GATEX has been approved in pediatrics. Um, in the beginning, I was struggling a little bit more with getting approval. Now, at least in New York, it's it's a lot more straightforward. I think they're a little bit more used to it. Um, the way that the whole process starts is that your physician fills out a start form and that gets sent to one path and they assist in getting the insurance covering. They let us put the insurance coverage and they let us know which pharmacy to send it to. Every six months, we have to renew that authorization. So there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. And then once your child hopefully is off of TPN, we do continue GATEX and we've been able to get it covered. But every insurance is different and I'm sure that you've all experienced changes. Every year is different with every insurance, uh, but there are things that we can do to support you. There is copay assistance programs. Um, as Jared mentioned, there's the rare disease organization NORD. We have been able to get grants to, to help cover some of the copay costs that some patients have had. 
Uh, but in, in general, I, I've been able to get it covered for every one of my patients. Thank you. Next up, there's a comment from Lisa. Thanks for sharing your story, Kelsey. And another question, have you found, Kelsey, have you found ways to connect with other caregivers who have had similar experiences? And if so, where, how have you found that community? Yeah, there are some um, support groups on Facebook um, that I recommend searching for. Um, and there's a lot of pretty big network of caregivers and patients, but primarily caregivers. Um, so if you just go in the Facebook search and kind of like search around for some, you know, short ball syndrome, those sorts of things, you can find a, quite a few groups actually on there. There's a couple that are quite large and then some smaller ones as well. Um, and that's been really helpful. I've become friends with some other moms on there who are in, you know, Michigan and way different places where I would have never met them and, um, and still kind of keep in touch with each other and see how our children are doing. Thank you, Kelsey. There's a question from Andrea, but not sure what it means. How long does it take on average? It seems to take months for us. Yeah, and Andrea, can you clarify, are you referring to getting the insurance process covered or for the medication to work? Because I, I, can, I can answer both of those. I think they're both good questions. Um, so for, for the insurance process to get it covered, it should be only a few weeks. Um, with some insurance providers, I haven't needed to even do a prior authorization, which is kind of a process where we have to call the insurance and send in some more information, proving that the child is on PN. Um, so some of some insurances, I haven't had to even do that part. If, if we you do have to put in a prior authorization, it should take a few weeks. I would say if it's taking more than two to three weeks, you really should reach out to your provider to find out what is going on. Um, sometimes the insurance just needs additional information and sometimes that gets lost in translation and the, your provider might not be aware that they need to send that. So if it's more than two to three weeks, uh, definitely reach out to your provider. And then I think the other question is also more important. How long does, does it take to kick in? Um, I touched about this a little bit before, but it, it usually starts to work within three to four weeks. I have had some parents tell me that within a week, they're seeing the, the stools becoming a little bit more formed, a little bit of an increase in energy level in their kids. Um, and one thing that is very important to, to, to know that every child is completely different. So I mentioned some of the data from the clinical study, Kelsey shared, shared, shared her child's experience. Everyone is going to respond differently. For some kids, it might be weeks, some, it might be months. I would say definitely give it at least six months to a year to, to really see an effect before giving up that this, this is not working for your child. That was what I was going to add on to that as well as we were, we, it did take a little while for us longer than what we had anticipated in our experience. And we were feeling a little bit defeated, like, oh my gosh, we're doing this injection every night and nothing is happening. And then it, it happened. And so it just, it can take a while. And that was our experience with it. Thank you both. Uh, there's another question. Is Gatex primarily prescribed only by specialty centers or do primary care doctors or gastroenterologists not at a major center able to prescribe or manage? So that, that is a very good question. So um, any provider can technically prescribe it. Um, we, as providers, have to go through special training, which is a very quick training called a REMS training, making sure that we as providers know what the side effects are, that we're familiar with the clinical data and the monitoring. Uh, but any provider can go through that process and prescribe it. I have found that some more like local gastroenterologists that are, that are not part of an intestinal rehab center have some fear in prescribing it because they're just not as experienced with it, but they definitely can. Um, and then what you could also do is have your provider reach out to a center if, if they're not experienced with it. They know there, there's definitely education that we can provide to them to get them more comfortable in prescribing it. But technically, whoever is managing your TPN should be able to prescribe it for you. I see that the next question is, has GATX been tested with any other diagnoses beyond SBS? Um, as of as of now, it's only approved for short bowel syndrome, so not for all intestinal failure. So just for patients that are missing part of their small intestine. And then, and there's the other. 
Yeah. What is you the go ahead, Jack. Period? Yes, I'll, I'll read it. I can read it. What is the longest period of time you are aware of a patient being on GAPTEC so far? What are long-term benefits and risks? So it, in pediatrics, it's been approved for four years. Um, it's been around longer because of the clinical trial in the US and it's been um, approved longer in Europe and in adults, it's been approved for 10 years, again, longer in Europe. So we, we do have more long-term data on it. Um, we are doing some outside of the clinical trial post what's called post-marketing studies to look at the benefits and the safety. So I think that is something to, to look out for in the next couple of years, we'll have some more information on that. Um, but as, as far as we are aware right now, there are no new side effects um, other than the ones that I've mentioned. We have also one comment from Michelle. Hi, Michelle. So Michelle says she's here representing Transplant Unwrapped. Um, so I, I will second the shout out to their website. They have a, a really great website, transplantunwrappedkids.org, um, that has a lot of extra support, um, such as virtual support groups, animations, webinar libraries, some books, um, additional books that we are hoping to work on. Um, and really there's a lot of support out there online, especially the, the Facebook groups. So that a lot of resources for you to, to connect with, uh, with other parents. Um, and that have gone that have gone through you know the experience of, of, of FBS in itself and have gone through being being on GATEX. I think it's still something that there, there is not as much awareness that it, for some centers that are not a part of the big centers and that is why we, we kind of want to focus some of these programs like today's program with Oli to share it with, with you directly so that you have all the information so that if your caregiver is uh, your sorry if your provider is not suggesting it to you as a caregiver you do have the knowledge and to suggest it to them. And it might not be right for everybody, but it's always something that we should have as a discussion. Is GATEX right for me? Is it, is it the right time? Should we think about this now? And I, I, one other thing I will say, I have had patients that I didn't think it was the right time for them. Um, they maybe were having other things going on, but there, there are times that in the future that we, we might want to, want to use it. And so again, it's a discussion to have and it's a continual discussion. So if your child is not yet one years old, I think it's approved only after age one. It can definitely be brought up later on, but you should know that it is it is available. And Maisie also added in that Oli also has a, a support group focused on HPEN consumers and caregivers, and she put the link in the chat. Another really great resource. Excellent. Uh, if there are no, oh, oh okay. Question from Martha. Do you want, do you want to so Martha is asking, yeah. So are there any cases where GATEX didn't make a difference in absorption and weight gain? Um, so there definitely can be. And again, it, it might not work for everyone. As I mentioned in the beginning, everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. Um, the GLP-2 amount that you might, child might have might be different. Um, so there are times where it doesn't work. Again, I would say give it at least six months to a year to really see a difference. Um, and some of those differences might be more subtle. So you might not be coming off of TPN, but we might be able to decrease the volume. Your child might be having some more form stools. They might have an increase in energy level. So there are some things that, that we're maybe not directly measuring that might still be a benefit. Um, and I have had patients that I've tried it on, didn't work the first time around. I had to stop it. They had other things going on, admitted to the hospital with other things. We took a break, restarted it later on and, and had a great outcome. So just keep that keep that in mind as well. Uh, Beth, wonderful question. So Dr. Kinberg, what is your hope for the future of those with intestinal failure? What continued innovation is needed in this space? What questions do we still not know but need to study for this population? All right, so how much time does everybody have to stay on for me to, for me to answer that? Because that will take a while, but I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a short answer. Um, I think there's still a lot that needs to be done. I think there's, you know, I, I'm very involved in the Oli Foundation right now. I'm, I'm part of the board. I think there's a lot of advocacy that we need to do as providers for, for you and your children. I think the shortages of things that, that are never ending have to stop. I think it's very unfair um, to, you, to you and to your children that manufacturers really can't, can't get their act together and there's shortages that should not ever be happening. There should not be issues with TPN, there should not be issues with medications, with central lines. And this is still something that we are struggling with and that I'm hoping that we can make a difference so that we don't have to ha have continuous discussions on what, it, what is the shortage of, of, of the week or the month. Um, I think there's still innovation that is needed um, 
with, with GLP-2. So I, I envision a time where we can measure your child's GLP-2 level and, and target the treatment a little bit more towards your child. I think we are, we are not there yet, but I think there's a lot of room for research to try to see, you know, what is the optimal dose for, for your child? Do we need to tweak it more? Um, and a lot of research. And one thing that we're also shifting to is trying to do research together with you as the caregiver. So you need to tell us what the issues are. We need to work together with you um, so that we can, you know, we, we, ha we have the ability to do the studies, but you, you have the ability also to give us what the questions and the issues. So we need to hear from you and know what else needs to be done. And one other question for Michelle, will patients have to be on GATEX forever? That is a very good question that we don't yet have the answer to. Um, so in some older kids and in adults, people are doing a trial of coming off of GATEX. We just don't have the data right now um, to know if this is something that can be stopped. So the, the children go through that natural process of adaptation. They go through it really in the first couple of years. So there's a chance, especially if you're starting GATEX on a younger child, there is a chance that they might not need it forever if their body's able to adapt enough. Um, but it really all depends on if, if they have like a GLP-2 deficiency, it's the same as having you know, a growth hormone deficiency or an insulin deficiency, and you have to just give the body the replacement for what it can't make. So I think we, we don't have a direct answer to that. Um, but it's definitely, if your child is doing really well off of TPN, they're gaining a lot of weight, it's something that can be discussed and you can try to, to, to wean them off of it. Um, but we just, again, just don't have the data on that right now. So we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we need more data and it will come. Does anybody have any other questions? I think Michelle posted one after, um, will patients have to be on GATEX forever? That, that's the one that I just answered. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I will just add one, one final comment that you know, for anybody that is debating, is this right, is it not? Have that discussion with, with your provider. Take a look on the website. There's a really, really nice video, um, which I, we really need to, to share it more with everybody, but take a look at that video because I think it really explains exactly what those villi are what happens when you don't have enough GLP-2 and how GATEX works to, to help with that, increase the GLP-2 and help increase absorption. And I think it's, it's worth a try. So if your provider thinks this might be for you, you can always try it. And worst case scenario, it didn't work, at least you tried. And if you're getting the answer from your provider that they are not familiar with it, that they don't wanna start it, have have them reach out. Um, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to, to Kata, to reach out to Oli, we can provide education for them, or you can do a consultation at a different center who might be more experienced with it, but you shouldn't take that as a final answer if, the, if your provider says that they they just, they can't do it or they, they're not familiar with it. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Kimberg, Kelsey, Macy. We can pass it back to you that since that concludes that, our presentation. Thank you so much. I'm just going to unpin you real quick and share my screen. And all right, just have a little bit of an outro slide. Thank you so much to our participants for attending, um, to our presenters for sharing their time and their expertise, and for Takeda, once again, for making this event possible. Um, this There will be a recording of the presentation available for viewing on our website, um, hopefully by the end of the week, if not early next week, at oli.org slash mini meetings. Um, and we're hoping to send it out to the folks who registered but weren't able to attend. Um, and if you want to stay involved with um, Oli in other ways, definitely become a member if you haven't already. There's no cost and you will stay up to date on um, upcoming events and resources, um, conferences, summits, all the things that are coming down the pipe. Um, if you are a patient or caregiver or know of a patient or caregiver, um, check out our website and view our schedule of support groups. There are some for caregivers specifically, um, PN, EN, 
and we're working to branch out and offer some more specific uh, social hours for caregivers, siblings, spouses, um, and really try to provide support for as many different groups as we can. Um, and also just a plug for our healthcare professional directory um, at ole.org slash public underscore directory. But you can also um, find it by going to the resources tab on our website. Um, and then just follow us on social media. So Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn are our three biggest. Um, and we'll have some more uh, content and resources coming at you. We have Malnutrition Awareness Week coming up in September and HPN Awareness Week coming up in October. So we've got a lot um, coming up in these next couple of months and we are so excited to share it all with you. So once again, thank you so much for attending. Um, we did wrap up a little bit early, um, but I will uh, work to make slides available and uh, the recording available um, so people can go and rewatch um, or answer any questions that we need to. So. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you so much. I'll have a great afternoon.